Hey family, I'm Pastor Torre. Welcome to One YouTube channel. You're getting ready to hear a phenomenal message. It's going to bless you. I have a couple of quick announcements really quickly. First of all, if you're not subscribed to this channel, go ahead and click the subscribe button so that you'll be notified anytime we go live, anytime we've got something that's going to bless you. Number two, if you want to support our ministry, we do great things as you're going to experience, but we also do great practical things and we can certainly uh, use your support. The instructions are on the screen if you want to give. And last but not least, my new book, Balance, is available for pre-order now. It is a game-changing, life-changing book. You can go to thebalancebook.com and get it, and there's certain things that you will have access to just by pre-ordering. So go to the website. All the information is there. Now let's get into this powerful, amazing word. God bless you. Happy Sunday, family. I'm so excited to be with you this morning. You know, I send greetings from our pastors, Pastor Teray Roberts and Pastor Sarah Jakes Roberts. And even right now, just let us know in the chat where you are tuning in from because I recognize our global family. Hallelujah. You see, I'm so excited for this message because it was a message that the Lord gave me even before I started to prepare. And even before we dive into it, I just want us to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We can never have um, get to a place where we have enough of you. And so, Lord God, we are just so excited to dive into you even deeper, Lord. We pray that you will take over this moment, that Holy Spirit, that we are in partnership with you, not just for the word to be delivered, but for the word to be received. And so, Lord God, have your way. We thank you for this day, and we thank you for the fruit of this word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Family, I want you to just, for, as you're taking notes, I'm not going to guess if you're taking notes. I believe you're taking notes. <laughs> but as you're taking notes, um, we're going to read Jeremiah 6.10. And normally, like, I love the New King James Version, but I saw this in the message translation, and it just captured my heart. And so Jeremiah 6, 10, it says this, I've got something to say. Is anybody listening? I've, I have a warning to post. Will anyone notice? It's hopeless. Their ears are stuffed with wax. Deaf as a post, blind as a bat. It's hopeless. They've tuned out God. They don't want to hear from me. You see, another uh, translation, that part, they don't want to hear from me, it actually says they have no delight in my words. Now, as you're taking notes, my message for today is, is anyone listening? Is anybody listening? You see, I don't know about you, but have you ever, maybe you've been <laughs> or you have experienced having a conversation with someone, and they're tuned out. And you only recognize they're tuned out by how they respond. I have a friend, a dear friend of mine. Anytime she says to me, man, that's crazy, just like that, I say, girl, you're tuned out. Because what I'm saying is not even crazy, it's quite emotional. <laughs> but I have been that person, and I have received it as well. When someone is having a conversation with us and we're just busy, maybe we, we, we're distracted by our, a text message or we're on Instagram or on social media or we're just so like lost in thought about something that we are, we're not present in that moment and when it's time for us to respond, we just go to our default setting. Wow, man, that's crazy. I don't know what, what your default setting is when someone is having a deep conversation with you and you tune out and you're not tuning out because it was intentional, but in the moment you were so much, you were so consumed with your stuff that you were not present for what they were saying. You see, when we think about moments like this, I wonder, you know, is this what we also do with the Lord, right? And this could even sound, for someone listening, you're like, look, I'm not trying to tune God out. Matter of fact, I'm trying to hear <laughs> what he's saying. What do you mean I'm tuning him out when I feel like he's not even talking to me? You see, I had a vision. The Lord gave me this vision. And in the vision, it was the word deaf. And when I saw that word deaf, the word D was um, was in a red font. It was like there was, a, there was a highlight with that word. And I'm going to circle back on why this was so important to this message. 
But the Lord began to show me this like when he showed me that, then he began to speak to me about why he's showing it to me. And what I understood is that there are many that you, you feel this sense of urgency. You feel this burden on your heart that there is something the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you. There is something the Lord wants to reveal to you. Maybe that's not how you have described what is happening, but you, there is, there is, you're not, you're, you feel restless. You feel as though where you are, it's nothing about, you know, not, not being where you are, but you know that there is something that is about to happen that needs to happen because of where your life is heading. There is a word that you need. And as I saw, as I saw this sense of urgency that is happening within God's people, I recognize that on the other side of it is to listen to the voice of God. It is to listen to what God wants to say in this moment. But you see, something I've recognized about the Lord is that based on the weight of what he wants to tell you, he has to break you out of your routine, out of your norm. Because as humans, we are creatures of habit. The moment something holy becomes a routine, it becomes ordinary to us. Have you thought about the Israelites? I mean, can you imagine manna from heaven, food from heaven, just showed up, you know? Nothing of such has ever happened before then. They, did, they were in the wilderness and they're complaining like, man, how are we going to eat? And Moses is like, you know what? God got us. There's going to be manna food just going to fall from the sky and feed us. That is wow. That is supernatural. If we saw food coming down from the sky in perfect condition, we would be like, oh, my God. If, matter of fact, we will say Jesus is coming tomorrow, <laughs> that this is so holy. I don't even want to eat it. Matter of fact, I just want to stare at it. But when it became a routine for them, when every day, manna, every day, food fell from heaven, every single day, they started to treat it as ordinary. All of a sudden, the people who were once grateful that God in his supernatural ability was able to provide food in a way that is not possible by man, they began to vent, they began to complain that, you know what? It's better we go back to Egypt where we were in bondage. It is better we go back to the place we cried out from that God save us. Because now that we have encountered God and it has become a routine, now we are treating it as ordinary, looking for the next thing. And so God recognizes that we are creatures of habit. Even though what brought us to this moment that we are in right now in your life, what brought you to the stage that God has set before you right now in your life was holy. But when holy becomes your routine, it starts to feel ordinary. So God has to break you out of your norm. God has to break you out of your patterns to get a word to you. You see, the word of God is so critical. It is so vital because the word of God, it is the creative force of God. When we think about it, the, the Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made through the word. Everything that is seen was made through and for the word. When we talk about the book of Genesis, when we think about the creation of light, for example, when God said, let there be light. And then the scripture says, and there was light. And that word, let there be light, was when God was literally saying, light, reveal yourself. And this is something that has stunned a lot of scientists because they're like, there's no way that light could be trapped in darkness because darkness is merely the absence of light. So how could it be that light was trapped in darkness? But it's not that light was trapped in darkness. Light was trapped in the word of God. When he released the word, he released light. You see, the word of God releases, it creates, it manifests. And so when you want to see change happen, the word is what gets us pregnant for what God wants to birth. The word is when, when a word comes to you, it is almost like heaven is coming in you. 
It's you, there's a oneness with you and what God wants to do in the world that you become pregnant with the kingdom that wants to be manifested on earth. And so the word is everything. So when we start to sense that there is something God wants to do, there is something God wants to say, and, and this could feel interesting, right? You could be wondering like, but if God is speaking to you that he wants to say something, why didn't he just say it? It, it just sounds quite ironic, right? But then you think about a man named Moses. Moses was a man who literally the Lord would say to him, Moses, there is something I want to tell you. Moses, I want to give you the Ten Commandments. In order for me to do this, I want you to come up to Mount Sinai. And when you meet me there, I would give this to you. There were at least in the Bible, it's at least recorded eight times when Moses had to go up to the mountain to meet with the Lord. This was not no easy journey. Um, that mountain is known to be at least a three hour hike uphill. It costs something to Moses to do that. But you'll be wondering, but why is it that Moses heard the voice of God telling him, I need you to come up to the mountain to actually access something deeper in me. Because right where you are, God could be telling you, there's something I need to share with you, but it's so weighty that if your environment is not equipped for what I want to tell you, you will do nothing with this. You will not perceive what I'm saying. I will be speaking, but you're not listening. And in order to get your attention, I need you to break out of your routine. And I want to talk to you today about some key areas that we don't even recognize that cause spiritual deafness. You see, there are many ways that the Lord speaks to us. I mean, the general way you could be reading your Bible and the Lord is literally speaking to you from the word, right? But there are ways the Lord also speaks to us through our senses, right? For some people, you might, you might recognize that, you know, you, you sense God's word through your emotions, Right When you have shared emotions with God concerning a decision, that's what many of us call, I don't have peace about this. When some, you're about to do something and you're like, oh, I don't feel peace on this. I, feel, I actually feel agitated. I feel angry about this decision I'm about to make because you are sensing God's emotion concerning what that could do in your life. And then there's some decisions you're like, oh my gosh, I feel the peace of the Lord in this. And it could make absolutely no sense to you, but you feel the peace of the Lord. So you can sense God's word through your emotions. You can sense God's word through your sights. That's when you see visions or you have dreams. You can sense God's words through your inner knower, right? That's when you have this conviction of something that you must do and you have the faith to do it, right? I mean, a great example are the disciples, Many of them followed Jesus without any, any full understanding of what they were about to get themselves into. There was just this conviction that, I, that, that gave them the faith to know, if I walk away from my business, I'll be fine. He is the one I must follow. So God can communicate to you through your inner knower. God could communicate to you through your inner ear. Where you begin to sense and hear the Holy Spirit speak to you about the things concerning your life. And it will always be things that will call you higher. It will be things that will challenge you to be more Christ-like. So there are many ways that God speaks to us, but all of this seems to not bring clarity into your now. And for some of you, you know, you're, you're, you're even going further. You're like, God, I want to be more sensitive. You're worshiping, you're praying, you're fasting, and it still feels like you're not receiving clarity. This burden is not lifting off of you. This understanding of a sense of urgency is not shaking off of you. And you're wondering, God, is it that you just don't want to speak to me? But why do I feel this way? And that's what I want to speak into today. You see, when we talk about deafness, spiritual deafness, it really points to the inability to receive what the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate. And when I talked to you earlier about that word D being highlighted, the Lord began to show me different things that causes us to be deaf to his voice. And the first thing, family, this, is, this would sound very common, but... We, we don't always apply it in the way we say it, but it's distraction. 
Now, when we say the word distraction, it sometimes gives this negative, you know, idea. And because it comes with this negative connotation, we don't recognize it in the most practical ways. You are like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be distracted. Because we think that being distracted, well, some of us think that being distracted means that we're entertaining the wrong things. But distraction sleeping is anything that takes you away from giving something your full attention. And so you can be distracted by a job, you can be distracted by a relationship, and in the context of listening to the voice of God, what I mean by this is that you can be so overwhelmed by the good things happening in your life that you don't recognize that you're just living in the default of your day-to-day. There's so much going on that you're just like, I just got to, I'm just living in the routine of my day to day that you have not taken the time to actually just sit and say, God, what is it that you might be trying to communicate to me? Or not even trying because God is always speaking, but what is it that I'm not perceiving because my mind is focused on everything else around me? You see, as the Lord was teaching me this, he was also speaking to me. Because the Lord showed me that, Stephanie, there's also something I need to tell you. And I, I, don't, I just don't need, you know, the time that you give me in the morning. The, first of all, the beauty about God is that you can talk to God at any time, anywhere. But intentional communion, when you want to receive from God, that is different. Moses could speak to God anytime, anywhere. But when God needed to give Moses something weighty, he said, meet me in Mount Sinai. Because there's something I need to give you. I, I, I know you can declare, you can speak, and yeah, you would hear me say a few things, but when there is something of weight, there is something monumental that will transform how you lead, how you do life, I need you to meet me. And meeting me means you need to remove yourself from anything that is a baggage in this moment. What does that look like in your life? I'll tell you in my life. You see, when the Lord says, Stephanie, I don't just need a few hours. What I'm about to tell you is going to bring a shift in your life. I need your day. And he showed me because I mostly work from home. So at home, I have a routine, right? That's the truth. I have a routine about my day. There's a time I know to wake up, to be in prayer, to spend time with the Lord. But I'm already programmed to think about, okay, I have several things I'm working on. So by this time, I'm going to do this. By this time, I'm going to do that. So when I'm in my house, even though this is a home that I pray and I worship, but my home reminds me of my patterns. And the Lord showed me, Stephanie, but for what I want to say to you, I need you to get out of your home. So you know what I did? I got online and started looking for hotels that I'm just going to go and it's going to be me and the Lord. And the beauty is of this is that this is not, it's not like, oh my gosh, every day of your life you need to live like this isolated island. No, there are moments where something monumental is about to happen in your life and God needs you to come up. He needs you to come out and up. Come out of your routine and come up to meet with me. Because what I'm about to tell you in this one setting could impact the next five years of your life, could impact the next seven years of your life. We're going to talk every single day, but there is something I need to download to you. And it's weighty. And it's not something you can just easily, you know, just be like, and while I'm in journaling, Lord, what, what, what is that? Oh, boom, got it, good. When you think about Moses, there are times that Moses will be on the mountain 40 days to receive just two things, two tablets of stone that had commandments on it. But 40 days to receive that? And it will cost you something. I'm not saying, you know, how to find this in your comfort. Sometimes and costing you something could even be a day away. That you just need a day that you silence yourself from work, you silence yourself from everything and say, God, it's me and you right now. What is it that you want to download to me about the next whatever years of my life? Because for many of you, where you are right now was connected to a vision and instructions that the Lord gave you. There were instructions that the Lord gave me that brought me to this moment. 
There were, there were words that the Lord, that it, it came from a place of consecration with God. And what does God need you to consecrate yourself for about where he's propelling you to? You see, at the start of this year, I'm holding on to this so dearly. The Lord began to speak to me about 2022 being a year we embrace the shift. And the shift will come in many ways. A shift in your authority, a shift in your responsibilities, a shift in your identity. But all of this is revealed and released through the word. You see, some of you, even where you are right now, you're in a city, you're in a country, and you keep sensing that God is about to shake you out of it. But it's not just for you to move into another city, into another state, into another country. Every time you're going into a new territory, you need to know your assignment for the territory. If not, what is in that territory that is against you coming could destroy you. You just don't go places. That is why even in the scriptures, when Paul was going into, uh, but Peter was going into a certain territory, the Holy Spirit didn't allow him. It, the Bible actually says that the Holy Spirit forbade him from going into that, into that region. That the Holy Spirit did not allow him because Peter, I know, you know, we out here <laughs> spreading the gospel everywhere, but this territory is not for you. That somebody else is assigned to this place. You're in a place in your life and you're feeling that God is about to shift things. We already see it in culture. Society is already shifting. I mean, we thought we were getting into a new normal. And all of a sudden, you know, domestic flights are having international flight fee energy, right? <laughs> culture is shifting again. But God is about to shift us and you need, if you're sensing what I'm saying, because I know as you're listening to this message that God ordained for you to hear this. Because as he showed this to me, it also hit me. There are times where you just need to remove yourself from distractions and say, God, it's me and you. My day is free. My day is clear. The same way you have vacation to rest. You have a vacation to sit with the Lord and say, God, speak to me about the decisions I'm about to make concerning my life in this season. Speak to me about the decisions I'm about to make concerning the next few years of my life. Because even, I'll give you an example, there was this project that came in. And when I saw the project, I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, it's about to be amazing. Everything about it looked great on paper. And I was just, whoo, couldn't wait to jump in. And every time I want to respond, I'm hearing God tell me no. <laughs> that Stephanie, I, you are not going to do this. And I'm just like, but, you know, it, I mean, like, wow, this is great, God. This is amazing. And he's like, no, no, not at all. I, this is actually, I'm, I'm deviating a little bit, but it will, it will connect. But he was like, you're not going to do this. And I'm like, God, but why? And he says, Stephanie, this is actually going to be a distraction and a hindrance. You see, our pastor has a book coming out, Balance. If you don't have it, pre-order it. But in the book, there's a chapter when he talks about the power of no, right? That it, when, when you make yourself available to everything, you could actually hinder yourself from the bigger things that God has for you. And the Lord said to me, Stephanie, you're not going to take this because if you take this, when what I have for you opens up, you will not be available to it. And the reason, actually, I'm giving this example is because there are certain things that you must have a sensitivity to with the Lord to know, God, what does this look like? What, what is the vision? What is the objective? What is the, what, what, what is the, 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 the purpose of this season in my life right now? I need to see this next five years the way you see it, Lord. He wants to say something to you, but he needs you to listen. And it may cost you something, family. But you have to recognize what God says to you in your morning prayer. That maybe there's something that is heavier that he needs to tell you. And those 10 minutes you allocate for him, it's not going to do it. Right? Now, number two is desire. 
Now, desire is a beautiful thing, right? The desire is supposed to be this beautiful thing because desire speaks to expectation. Desire speaks to faith. You know, there are two scriptures I noted here that even just to share with you um, as you're taking notes. Psalms 37, 4 says this, delight yourself in, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. That when we delight ourselves in God, he begins to put within us the things that we we ought to desire. And then Psalms 145, 19 says this, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will, he also will hear their cry and save them. You see, first of all, not only would God give you a desire, but he would even fulfill that desire. What does this mean, family? That desires also speak to God's purpose for you. It speaks to the plans that God has for you. And he wants you to also desire that thing. That's why he gives you what to desire because he's given you a sneak peek in what he has for your future. He's given you a sneak peek of the promises he has stored up for you. And he needs you to come in agreement with him. Because the Bible says, can two walk together except they agree. So when God wants to do a new thing in your life, you begin to notice it by the desires you start to have. The desires that just came, like you're like, wait, I, I was not even thinking about this. All of a sudden now I have this draw towards this thing. God has given you a sneak peek. But first it says, as you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart because they're also worldly desires, right? And worldly desires is not like a bad thing or whatever, it, but it, it just speaks to a very selfish intent. But now the reason I'm sharing this is that for many of us, we come into this place where, you know what, we are filled with desires that the Lord has put in our heart. But all of a sudden, we start to worship it and not the giver. We start to be so fixated on the desire and not the one through which it comes from. And when the Lord began to talk to me about this whole essence of desire, there's a scripture, write this down. In Philippians 3.19, it talks about a people whose appetite became their God. It says, and their appetite was their God. That in one moment, the Lord is like, oh my gosh, I have this beautiful promise for you. And the next moment, you are worshiping the promise over the promiser. How many times do we do that? How many times? Because this is the whole essence of disappointment. This is where disappointment comes from. And it comes from that because not only do we begin to worship the promise, we put a timeline on the promise as though we are the originators of this promise. And we say, oh my gosh, I desire this. You know what? I'm going to put a date on it. Not recognizing that even the desire is already God showing you what is yours. But to trust in his timing and to trust in what he's doing. And why I'm saying this to you, because you see, at the end of this message, I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to search our hearts. And to begin to reveal and uproot what are the things that could be causing spiritual deafness in the thing that God wants to say. Could it be that it is a desire? Because you see, family, anything that you meditate on, anything that you're fixated on is worship. And so when all you're fixated on is this desire, you begin to worship it. And when you worship it, the voice of your desire is what begins to lead your life. It becomes amplified and the voice of the Lord is dull. Because you're driven by your want. Have you ever met someone who is so driven by this goal that they will compromise even their own integrity to go after it? Because it is the voice of their desire that is driving their life. The voice of their desire is making their decisions. I was watching this documentary um, and the, it, there's even a show about it on, Net, on Hulu, The Dropout. If you haven't seen it, it is Man, that's crazy. <laughs> because when you watch this, you see how someone's desire blinded her from everything going on around her that it seems that she began to believe her own lies. It blinded her from just it, her integrity was whew, just out the window, just compromised. 
I was, I mean, I was stunned. She built a, a company that was valued to be a billion dollar company on a fraud. Her desire, what she desired was good. But she was so blinded by that desire, she began to lie. She began to manipulate. It was, I mean, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> but you see, when you're so fixated on a desire, that desire becomes your God. You're not looking at it like it's a God, but it is the observer that can tell you what is your God. That is why that scripture in Philippians could say, and their appetite became their God. The people did not say, it was not in first person. They didn't say our appetites are our God, but the one observing you would know who you worship. When God looks at your life, does he see the one who is sold out in worship to him? Or does he see the one who is in worship to desires? In worship to the things that he already has for you. But these are the moments where we have to be honest with ourselves. And if I'm speaking to you, and maybe it could be a desire for marriage, a desire for children. Whatever that desire is, it could be a desire for a business. A de whatever it is, if it has consumed you to the point that it is now in the place of your God, that it is the voice of that desire that is making the decisions for you. The reason that you're, the, the way, the, the, if you look at the, the past decisions, maybe just look at the past three decisions that were life changing. What led those decisions? Was it the desire or was it the Holy Spirit? And if I'm speaking to you, then all I ask is that you lay that before the Lord. Laying it before the Lord does not mean to give up on it. No. It doesn't even mean to kill it. You see, when we talk about Abraham, you know, many of you are familiar with the story about Abraham and Isaac. And we use that as an example many times to say, you know what, just kill it on the altar. But when Abraham was, you know, willing to sacrifice his son Isaac, Abraham was not letting Isaac go. He had a trust in God to know that even if I kill my son, that God has the power to resurrect him. Abraham knew that the promise is mine. So even if this is required of me now, I'm not letting him go. I know the God I serve can resurrect him the same way he resurrected Sarah's womb. And so when I say Give it to God. I'm not saying give up on the desire, give up on the dream, give up on what God put in your heart. I'm saying give up on your timeline. Give up on your way, the, the, your, your vision. Give up on the way you believe it would manifest. Give up on the way your plans. Because the Bible says God's ways are not our ways. Give up on your ways and surrender to how God wants to execute a thing. You see, sometimes God will put a desire in your heart for something that could actually happen in 20 years. And the, the reason he put it in your heart young is for you to always know what is yours. But the enemy confuses it and makes it look like God is just kind of is trying to toy with your emotions. No, God is saying, hey, be confident. Don't act like the pauper when you own the home. Don't lose yourself because you're after something that is already yours. You would have the keys when it's time. So God will put desires in your heart early so you know how to handle yourself. That you don't cheapen yourself for what is already yours. When Satan was in, in the Garden of Eden and he was trying to, you know, the whole deception for them to eat of the tree. Satan was trying to deceive them with something that was already theirs. He says, oh, when you eat of this, certainly you would, you know, you would know like God and you would know the, the difference and all that stuff. You would know good and evil, the, the knowledge of good and evil. You would be like God. And Eve is like, wow, this has the ability to make me wise. And they, they lost sight of the fact that you are already created in his image. You already had access to the wisdom of God. 
but it was about the timing. And so family, if there is a desire that has taken over you, just give it back to the Lord and say, God, I trust your ways. I trust your timeline. I trust what you want to do. I, I need to give this back to you because it has taken such a hold in my heart that I cannot hear what you're saying now. I can't even hear what you're saying that would even help me manifest this very desire. Right, family? And now the third thing is dishonor. Dishonor. Now, this one was so intriguing to me. You see, I, I don't know, maybe many of you might be aware of this, but when we think about, you know, earthly royalty, right? I'm sure the, one of the first people you think about would be Queen Elizabeth II. And with, in, you know, in, in the UK, there are do's and don'ts in how you approach the queen. There is a way you must call her. There's a, there, there's a language for how you approach her. There's these things that you say. And one of the things that even intrigued me is even in the don'ts, right? You cannot walk, you know, walk with your back turned towards her. They consider it rude. I mean, there is all this etiquette in how you must approach the queen. Now, this is earthly royalty. Now, let's talk about our etiquette when we approach the Lord. Now, like I said, the beauty about God is that he's everywhere. So you can talk to him driving, you know, in the you know, drive through in your house, cooking, feeding the baby. You can talk to him anywhere. But like I said, you're talking and you're, you, you can even, you know, you guys are in dialogue everywhere. But when those, there are intentional moments of communion, you have to look at what is your etiquette before the Lord. Are you coming into the presence of God? You have your phone in one hand. You're on Instagram while you have worship music on. So with your words, you're just worshiping the Lord. With your eyes, you're looking on Instagram. You're looking at, oh, this part, what? What is happening here? What is your, how do you honor the moments when God says, come up here. There's something I want to tell you. How do you honor the moments when you're like, God, I just want to be before you right now. I, there's something I need to hear from you. Are you bringing in the things that are actually dishonorable to that moment? Because then your attention is everywhere. And then and again, it brings in distraction. But how do we honor the moments that we create intentional space to commune with God? How do we honor those times? How do we set the tone? How do we set the atmosphere? Because I, I, there are things that I remember the Lord has allowed me to see, even on the spiritual front, and it really blew my mind. I remember this was a couple years ago. I was in college, and we were having, um, the church I was going to, we were having like this youth meeting and in the youth meeting, there was worship, there was all kinds of things um, taking place. And then all of a sudden, you know, the Lord opens my eyes and I see like, you know, around the team, there were like these angels around everyone. And all of a sudden, like the, there were the youth, you know, they were doing their own thing. Like we're in worship and, you know, praise. And I'm so I, I, I'm seeing this and people are like on their phones and they're chatting with each other. They're like, you know, talking to everybody's ear, you know, it's Somebody's talking about who likes who, whatever. And the whole time, what was really a burden to my heart is that there, was, there were things that the angels had to give. But there was a posture required for them to release it. And so while everyone was doing their own thing and, and just having a party, I literally i am seeing how the angels are there and they leave with the very things they came to deposit. What is your etiquette before God? Because even body language speaks a lot, right? I mean, right, in, 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 in culture, you have people who have like, I mean, a job in studying body language to tell you if you are lying or saying the truth. So even if, you're, if body language speaks a lot, all I'm trying to explain to you is that what is your posture before God? When you come before God and you're, you have the intention to say, God, I want to receive from you. What is your posture in that moment? 
What are the things that you're allowing to just take you, distract you, and just bring dishonor into it? I mean, I'm not, I'm not even, I'm talking about things that are also being highlighted to me. Because again, we could get caught up in routine, right? There are times that I, I've been guilty of, you know, coming before the Lord in prayer, and I have my laptop with me just in case an email I was waiting for came in. And then when it comes in, oh, hallelujah, you just turn around and start <laughs> replying to the email. Terrible. This is not, it's nothing funny. Right? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about these key critical times. Right? Just the way you think about it, in a relationship, there are times where you're, you're hanging out with your person, in a crowd, at home, people are around, you guys are just hanging out. But there are times when you want intimacy. Right, where it's just you and them. And in that moment, you just you want their, their attention. You want them to you want the focus to be about this moment. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the the you know the random moments where we get to talk to God at any point, but I'm talking about the moments of intentionality, the moments that you're cultivating intimacy, the moments where you're like, God, I need you to speak to me. What is your posture in those moments? Right? You know, I'm I'm thinking about. Um, just a dear friend, Lisa Brevere, and we were filming um, a segment together for TBN called Better Together, and she shared a story that I love so much. She talked about when she was having kids, you know, there were moments where she just wanted to, like, she could sense that there was things that God wants to say to her. And obviously with kids, <laughs> you know, your, your time is different. You know, they wake up every two hours. <laughs> and you can't really, you're losing sleep, all kinds of things. But then she says to the Lord, and she's like, I would do anything. I would lose sleep to hear from you. Now, I, what, when I'm saying this, all I'm saying is that it would always cost you something for transformation. Transformation costs something, right? She's like, God, I will lose sleep because I'm sensing there's something you're, you're, you're trying to do here. And all of a sudden, she started waking up every day, just a few minutes after two, she would wake up by herself. So the first few days, she's like, I, it's probably, I'm, I'm going back to bed. When it happened, you know, you know, just day after day, day after day, she's like, wait, this is the Lord. The Holy Spirit is actually, I just said to him, Lord, I will lose sleep. <laughs> and he's like, all right now, all right, I'm going to wake you up. And so she got up and then she sat with the Lord where at the time where, you know, the babies are sleeping, all of that. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit began to download to her. And she brought out her journal and she started writing. And the things he began to say to her were things that were so key about the shift that was coming into their lives. What am I saying, family? Wherever you are, if you're sensing this burden upon you, if you're sensing this restlessness, if you sense that there is something that God urgently needs to tell you that will shape the next couple years of your life, you got to break out of your pattern. Bring honor into those moments. Don't make excuses and just say, oh, you know, this is happening or that is happening. I need to be on my phone. I need to do this. I need to do that. No, bring honor into those moments. Whatever is a sacrifice on your level, but break out of whatever is your routine right now, right? And lastly, family, disappointment. Disappointment. You see, disappointment it is what it is, right? When you have an expectation and it did not happen, we get disappointed. And we've heard, I'm sure you've, you, we all know this, right? We know that at the end of the day, whatever is happening to us is not happening against us, but it's happening for us. And even when we have an expectation, it didn't work out. It reveals that something about our expectation wasn't in alignment with the Lord. But there was something the Lord showed me to tell you. Because... Disappointment is, it's the emotion of disappointment can be very disheartening, whether it's in a relationship. We know, we know all this stuff. We know that, you know what, God, you protected me. You kept me. This rejection is protection. We know that. But then you, we are still overwhelmed by the emotional pain, the emotional trauma, the hurt and all of that. And the Lord said, I should tell you this, your life is bigger than that one event. Your life is bigger 
than that one moment. There is so much more to your life than that piece of your story. You got to move on. I get it. You were maybe in the wrong relationship. Maybe things didn't pan out the way you wanted. There were, you, you thought you heard from the Lord. You thought something was an instruction and you moved on it. Your life is still bigger than that one moment. You have to move on. And whatever it takes to move on, if you need to go into therapy to move on, you do that. But you have to move on. Because when disappointment is left unchecked, it hardens your heart. And your, when your heart is contaminated in that way, you cannot, it blocks your ability to hear from the Lord. You see, I'll give you an example because this appointment is connected to so many things. Unforgiveness, all of that is all coming from a place of hurt. There was a time that, to my surprise, you know, because I thought I was the forgiveness queen, right? But there was something that hurt me in a way that I didn't let it go immediately, you know, because it wasn't just the hurt, it was the disappointment. And there was a day that I was praying about something. I was asking the Lord and I was like, Lord, I need you to speak to me concerning this, uh, something else, a separate matter. I need you to speak to me concerning this. You know, I want you to just, as I'm going to bed, Lord, I want you to just speak to me in my dream. I said, this is time for, you know, just... This is a moment where you should just pour yourself out. I'm going to bed. I'm resting and you're speaking. Okay. The best of both worlds. <laughs> but I was like, God, I need you to speak to me. And you know what I had a dream about? A very vivid dream that seemed to go on for days. It was about the unforgiveness. God was showing me what I needed to let go. And why is that the thing he showed me when I'm asking him for something else? Because that is blocking my heart. That has caused a blockage in my ability to truly hear him. Because you see the Bible, there, there are few words that describe God. When it, when it, when it speaks to the, the essence of who God is, right? We know God is the word, right? But another word that describes him is that God is love. And what he is and what he embodies is how things flow through. So you cannot have a hardened heart and the essence of God flows through you. Your heart cannot be hardened and the one that is love you can receive from. And so whatever disappointed you, whatever hurt you, whatever wronged you, your life is still bigger than that moment. Allow it to teach you because at the end of the day, we are students of everything. Let the moment, let, let it teach you. No failure is ever wasted. No disappointment is ever wasted. Let it teach you, but let it go. Now that one you can kill. Matthew, you can kill Barry and forget the burial ground. <laughs> because at the end of the day, there's so much more to you. And God wants to reveal that more to you. But you got to let it go. You see, my assignment today was to simply reveal the areas that, where, where this, that could cause us to come into a place of spiritual deafness. It was to expose it and bring it to the light. And this is the moment where the Holy Spirit begins to partner with you. You see, David would say things like, I, I love David so much. He's someone I admire so greatly in the Bible because I, I, I love when I read his prayers. I love when I read the, the words of his worship. And David will say, search my heart, O oh God. If there is anything offensive in me, search me and show me the way to everlasting life. These were the words of David. David would say things like, look, I don't know what could be clogging me in this moment. I don't know what could be causing a blockage in me in this moment. So God, search my heart. If there is anything offensive, show me the way to everlasting life. I believe in this moment, the Holy Spirit is searching your hearts. And he is bringing to the surface 
what could have been causing a blockage. That while you felt like, God, you're not even speaking to me. I have all these things I want to ask you. Not realizing it's not that he wasn't speaking, but we were not listening. And not that we were not listening because we want to tune God out. But we had all these things that by default, we were tuning God out. And so as the Holy Spirit searches you, it's not about shame. It's not about guilt. It's about truth. It's for God to establish his truth in you. And so what if you have been moving in disappointment, release it. Open your heart and say, God, I was hurt. That wounded me. I gave X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 whatever it is. Let the Lord know and let him show you that what's ahead is still bigger. That what's ahead is still much brighter. He said, I, my, my, I, I love my Igbo name is in Kirika. And that name is always a reminder to me because what that name means is that the future is greater. It's always a reminder to me that it doesn't matter the disappointments you may have experienced. What's ahead is still greater. Your life, the fact that you still have breath means that God is not done with you on this earth. There is still many things that you are yet to discover about you and about what you have been called to give to the earth. And God said it is still on course. So let that go. If you have been, you know, just clogged by a desire, release the timeline. Be in purpose with God. Work towards it. But stop putting this pressure of timeline. A good friend of mine, Major, has this saying, move at the pace of grace. I love it so much because grace is God's empowerment. And essentially what he means is that move as you are empowered. So don't try to go outside of what God has empowered you to do in the now. Because that's when compromise begins to set in. Manipulation begins to set in. Offense begins to set in. Move at the pace of grace. Whether you have been distracted and God is saying, hey, son, hey, daughter, I just need a day with you. Or maybe I just need a couple hours with you. Or maybe I just need one hour with you. Whatever it is, whatever would break you out of your current routine. Because God has seen that this which was holy has now be been treated as ordinary. Whatever will break you out of your routine, break out of it. So that God can allow you to break out the kingdom through you. Whatever it is, family, I want you to know that you are not in this by yourself. That the Holy Spirit would empower you. And the Holy Spirit would open up your channels. That you can receive what's needed in this moment, in this season of your life. And so I want to pray with you. And maybe you're tuning in and you're like, I haven't really figured this, you know, Jesus thing out. You know, a friend of mine sent me the link. They told me to, hey, like, you know, check out this message. Or maybe I've been, you know, dating the idea of being a believer. It is one of the best decisions. Actually, not one. It is the best decision that you ever make. And we're not paid to say that. You know, it's not like there is some kind of supernatural bank account that we are advertising that every time we do this commercial, give your life to Jesus, the best decision you've ever made, that money shows up somewhere in the supernatural account. It's not that, it's our testimony, right? Sometimes it could seem like, man, you know, is this a lot required? No, it's not. It's, it's the beauty of relationship. It's the beauty of freedom. It's the beauty of God bringing you into your highest true self. The version of you that he saw before he placed you in your mother's womb. So if you have been dating this idea of knowing the Lord, why don't you also surrender your ways and just say, Lord, here I am. 
here I am. I actually want to tap into this fully. God, I want to know you. And you see, for some of you, you're just feeling this, this fire on your chest. You feel like something is burning you on your chest. And it is the Lord saying, hey, I'm knocking. Let me in. Give me a try. Let me show you who I really am. It's not just what the people said about me. You're going to experience me for yourself. You see, I sense that for some of you listening, that the Lord is just reminding me of the Samaritan woman, right? When she encountered the Lord, read the story, it's in the book of John, very powerful. When she encountered the Lord, she goes and she's sharing her testimony and telling other people, you must meet this man who told me everything I've ever done. And many ran to see him. She was like, this is the Christ we have been waiting for. And so because of her testimony, they were intrigued. They said, let us go see this man. Let us meet this man that you're saying is the Christ. But then the scriptures later tell us that it is not because we came because we heard her testimony. But now we believe because of his words. You see, you might be drawn because you're hearing things about the Lord from other people's testimonies. But when you open up your heart to Jesus, you will realize that your roots will be developed because of his personal relationship with you. When you begin to encounter a love like no other, the love of Jesus is unfailing. It is relentless. It is not the way the world loves. Jesus truly loves without conditions. He says, wherever you are, I love you. Whatever you have in your hand, it doesn't matter. I love you. You may be high right now, but I love you. And let me introduce you into who you are. That is what Jesus, that's, that's how Jesus moves. He doesn't look at you. The Bible says that he did not come to condemn the world, but he came that the world might be saved. Jesus is not looking at you and condemning you. Jesus is not looking at you wondering how dare you, how could you? He is not like that. Jesus is looking at you with all your mess. He says, look at my child. Look at my beautiful child. Oh, how I just love that daughter. How I love my son. And all his waiting is let me in. He might challenge you, but it's for your good. He might discipline you, but it's for your good. And so family, if you're saying yes to Jesus, I want you to just put in the chat right now. Here I am. And as you say, here I am, you're going to see a QR code on the screen. I want you to give us your information so we can contact you. It is the best decision you would ever make. And you see, family, we're going to pray in this moment. And we're just going to pray for the Holy Spirit to perfect what he already started. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We are at your mercy, O oh God. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that none of what has been spoken could have fruit if not for your power, if not for your enablement, if not for your partnership, oh God. And so Lord, I pray that you will come upon your people in such a beautiful way, that you will come upon your people, Lord God. Not only are you revealing the areas, Lord, that require change, but that you will give them the empowerment to change. And so Lord Jesus, we thank you. Have your way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Family, I'm just so grateful for today.